Hi guys. If you're familiar with the history of the Tanatlin Railway, you may well know that when they began to run passenger trains up to Nanguernal, the original line was far from suitable. It was dangerously close to the edge of the cut-in, and the volunteers worked tirelessly to build a newer, safer line further into the rocky hillside. And whilst this is what we now use at the railway, the old line is still visible, with some V-tippers on it, as you approach the station. Alec at Westcliff Work offered to print these tippers for me, which I was more than happy to accept, because they're at the same standard of quality as their commercially available products. Cheers mate. They made two full tippers, and two frames without the, well, the tipper. I'm hoping to have enough room to fit all four of these on the layout. I think the fact that these have dummy, prototypical wheels will really help them look convincing on the layout. Resin prints from Westcliff Works, and indeed other makers such as Minibuilds or Brooks 3D, seem to require less and less prep to the prints prior to painting, which is amazing, and I love how quickly 3D printing has advanced since it became available. The only work these tippers will need is a quick filing around the support spots on the underside. Well, you could get away without it as it's only on the bottom, but it takes like 30 seconds, so I think it's worth doing. The tippers are then glued on to cotton buds, though for some reason the superglue today isn't playing ball. Not to worry, a little help from superglue free spray and I'm ready to prime. These tippers will eventually get heavily rusted up, so for that base I'll use a red oxide primer. You could say that the red oxide would be suitable for top coat for rust, but I find it a bit too strong. With that in mind, I'll spray the model in a much more toned down version of red oxide. The only issue with paints such as Humbrol acrylics I'm using here is that the finish is so smooth that weathering powders will struggle to key to the surface, so you may want to spray the model with a varnish or something after using them. As a comparison, the tipper on the left is red oxide primer, and on the right has just been sprayed its new colour. Similar to the scenics on the layout last week, a subtle alteration to the saturation of colour completely changes the look of the model. I like to use weathering powders for jobs like this because of the soft edges it produces. I did think I would go with a strong rust colour, but then I found this one in the drawer. It's rusty, but it's also kind of dirty or dusty, so I first coloured the whole thing with this. If you're new to weathering powders, it's a messy job and it's not easily wiped up. Instead, applying the powder to the model above the pot works wonders. And because I seem to have started comparison footage this week, the left one here has had its powders applied. And as I'd mentioned before, the powder didn't quite stick as well as I'd hoped, and should need a bit of varnish, but my spray booth has broken. Yeah, add that to the list with a static grass applicator. Anyway. Rust isn't a uniform finish, so I'll get some different tones to different parts of the model. Fresh rust looks darker and richer than old rust, so I'm going to add that onto protruding parts as of metalwork and corners on the tipper. When looking at reference photos of these V-tippers, it appears that the metal is either stained or got deposits on the top edges, such as the rim of the tipper itself. I did try to replicate this with white weathering powder, but in the end, painting it on gave crisp and sharp markings. The method I'm using here is almost a heavy dry brush with a brush that's past its best, which gives these nice random patterns. The same technique is carried on down the frame of the V-tipper, as well as on the inside of it. The final stage for painting up the V-tippers is a good black wash. I'm using this not only to darken the finish of the entire model, but also to create shadows and depth through things like the wheel faces and other areas. 009 is such a small scale to work in, and it can be difficult to give visual weight to the model, 
so anything that creates artificial shadows is sure to help you. The strange thing is, I've been struggling with black wash recently, and I'm pretty sure I've accidentally mixed something into the bottle that's altering the surface tension of the paint. So if you see my recent videos, you'd have seen the paint struggling to key onto the surface of models. But it's working really well with this model, most likely because the powders are a good uneven finish for it. Ok, they're all done, so I can add them to the layout. Ah, I haven't made the scenery here have I? Okie dokie, we better do that now. I quickly started to lay down the same ballast used on the main line, as I thought it was the same stuff. I also found a lovely soft brush to pat down the ballast nice and level. That is until I looked at my reference photos and notice that this area has been finished in slate, not ballast, and yes, it does make a difference. With the realisation, I swept up the ballast and put it back in a pot for another time, and spread down slate dust. Again, the soft brush is being used the same way as with the ballast. And because I'm on a roll for forgetting things this evening, once the slate looked nice and level, I have to sweep it to the side, because I've forgotten the track work that the tippers are to sit on. To top that blunder off, I also realise that I don't have a single piece of 009 track spare in the house, and it's about 11 o'clock at night now, so I can't exactly pop over to the local model shop, which is 30 miles away. Not to worry, I've ripped up some old rail off an old diorama that I used to take photos on. I'll just have to glue that down. In the end, this line is actually sunk into the ground up there, so you wouldn't need to see the sleepers on the model, or something like that, whatever makes myself feel better. As soon as the glue holding the rail down is dry, I can brush the slate back over the ground, and this time, in between the rails that I definitely should have remembered to put in the first time. I really like this brush, it's so soft. As with any fine ballast type material, the surface tension needs to be seen to before applying glue so the whole area is sprayed with IPA out of the bottle designed for hairdressers, because for some reason I have well stocked supply of hairdresser products to use in modelling these days. When the slate looks wet enough I'll start to apply the ballast bond. You'll see how I really flood the area with ballast bond and that's not a mistake. When this dries it'll set solid. I also started to panic when I saw this because of how dark the slate has gone when it's gone wet and on photos, the slate area is actually lighter than the ballast along the new track bed. But when it dried, it dried really light, so I smiled again. I've also started to give the slate a weathering with a very runny black wash. What I hope will happen with this is that the black will sink between the gaps to create depth in the slate surface. And whilst it's still wet, I'm going straight on to applying the first layer of Scenics. I used this product on the opposite side of the track, as well as the moss on the rocks last week, so it seemed the right stuff to use for this mossy floor covering. I'll apply a coat of hairspray on top just to help seal it in. Of course we come back to the issue of colour, which I hate now, so the same process is used to alter it. The first coat is earth brown, which basically makes it all look dead. Then I'll apply a new mossier green over the top of it. And then finally a very sandy colour, lightly on the tips. The thing about modelling is once you've discovered a technique that works for you, such as this new colour system I've just come up with, you can apply it in so many different ways to a variety of layouts and you gain a real confidence as you build your library of techniques up. And as you've seen on my videos, sometimes a technique works really well, but sometimes it just doesn't. That's ok, it's just a case of try and test until you find one that does. Anyway, since that speech went on for so long the paint's all dry and I can apply the leaf scatters to blend in this area with the others around it. I have sprayed hairspray just now, 
so the leaves should stick down just fine. I'm keeping the palette the same. And that's actually only two colours of leaves, orange and brown. The next layer of scenics is some low shrubbery style hedge bush things. I'm just going to go in with the artistic approach with these ones and making them look the same as the other bushes on the layout, and that's just polyfibre with leaf scatters on top. Though because I actually need to make use of them, I'm going to use the polyfibre that I sprayed brown the other week. It appears that I have no footage for the leaves going on these bushes, but you get the idea by now surely. Well that's the scenics done here, so the whole area gets sprayed with earth brown to tone everything down for autumn. This is, again, one of my new key techniques for fine tune in the scene, and I love it. It really makes the plant life look like it belongs in a hospital bay at a garden centre, and yes, that's kind of what I was looking for with this one. Well, I was going to make the fence next, but the products I bought for it didn't look right, so let's just leave that. And glue the tippers down instead. Well that's this part of the layout finished for now, and I say finished and not complete because it's not. Not only is there a fence to do, but there are also trees as well as a little sign to make for it. Either way, it's exciting to get this part of the layout done even without the trees, because as you can see in the thumbnail for this one, it really helps to build up the scene in photos when taken from the platform area, which is one of the common angles I'll use to take footage on this layout when it's all finished and complete. I want to crack on with the scenics, but I've now got a little pile of coaches here that I need to make up. And no, technically they're not Talithlin coaches. Oh, that's cryptic. Okay, off you go. Cheers. <laughs> 